us today here in the Bay Area with warmer temperatures right around the corner. Now high pressure sitting just offshore and that's the reason why we're warming up and drying up as we head into this work week and taking a look at the winds. It's also the reason why we're seeing those winds mostly sweep in from offshore and just from the north too, heading into this afternoon with wind speeds maxing off close to around 15 miles per hour closer to around dinner time. Other than that though, it's a dry week for us not only today and tomorrow, but lasting into our weekend setup too. No rain in sight as high pressure sits directly offshore. It's going to keep us nice and dry and warm too. Our daytime highs today are sitting just a little bit above average and will continue to warm up as we head into the next couple days. About four to five degrees above average near San Francisco and Oakland. A similar trend down into the Santa Clara Valley. So let's take a look at those numbers over on the map now. 60s in San Francisco, not that bad. We'll see 70s by tomorrow. We're already seeing 70s off into the East Bay. That'll get replaced with 80s heading into our weekend forecast. And it's going to be a stunning one for us down in the Santa Clara Valley. As early as tomorrow, we'll be close to around 81 degrees just near San Jose. So that's the trend for us. We're flirting back and forth with upper 70s and lower 80s all week long, heading into our inland forecast and mostly sunny skies are expected for us, but we'll still see a little bit of clouds kind of mixed in the forecast. Nothing producing rain by any means. It's going to be dry for us along the bay too with upper 60s and lower 70s heading into our weekend forecast. We'll keep you updated on that here in the Weather Center. Well, yesterday you might have been caught up in this. Hundreds of protesters shut down these Major Bay Area arteries, 880 in Oakland and the Golden Gate Bridge, all to draw attention to the war in Gaza. Some even used chains and barrels filled with concrete to block the road. We asked one of the protesters on 880 about their message yesterday. They want to say that they're condemning what's happening, what Israel is doing, saying they want Israel to be nicer and kill fewer civilians. At the same time, they are giving them bombs and money. Well, the shutdowns lasted into the early afternoon before CHP was able to get all the lanes reopened. We know some commuters were stuck in their car for cars for more than four hours. At the beginning with, I was kind of afraid. I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I was afraid for my life. This is not fair for, you know, a lot of people, they go into work. You know, they're trying to, you know, make some money and uh, look what happened. And while the CHP had their attention on 880, another group took over the Golden Gate Bridge. Highway Patrol said they thought something like this might happen, but did not know specific plans. Protest organizers were very clear that this action was not their last, and a spokesperson told us what's expected to come next. We're going to keep pushing until people pay attention. We know from our history that people's actions work, and they won't listen to us unless we hit them where it hurts, which is in, a, in the economic region. And as the hours dragged on, commuters stuck on the roads had no choice but to wait it out. Although some were sympathetic to the protesters, some were also very frustrated. Like, yes, it's an inconvenience, but it's also an inconvenient to be a human being in Gaza. And when you have this level of a disruption to our whole transportation system, I think we need to draw a line. CHP says they arrested 26 protesters at the bridge demonstration. Four cars were impounded. A total of 38 people were arrested across both protests at the Golden Gate Bridge and 880. And our Sean Chittenis reports from the Golden Gate Bridge with a breakdown of the charges that they will face. It's turning out to be another typical morning along the Golden Gate Bridge with traffic moving in both directions. Quite the difference from what we saw yesterday. Today we know more about what charges protesters will be facing because of their actions on the bridge. Those charges include unlawful assembly, resisting an officer conspiracy, as well as false imprisonment. And that last one is a new charge we haven't seen before because of what they were able to do, keeping people stuck in their cars for hours. It speaks to the amount of preparedness that these protesters had for their actions, making sure it was as difficult as possible to remove them with heavy chains and barrels filled with cement. The CHP was quick to get in position on the Bay Bridge during all of this, but experts say they can only be so proactive with their current staffing. Every single law enforcement agency in California is shorthanded. And the more that we put these folks in a, in a position where they're sitting idly on a bridge, the more they can be doing things more productive elsewhere. So 
that's sort of a double-edged sword and a, and, a, and a personnel manpower challenge that they have to deal with. That's former FBI Special Agent Jeff Harp. He was actually one of the commuters caught up in the traffic yesterday. He says another thing that makes these kinds of protests tough to get ahead of, we're no longer seeing planning happening on social media. It's all going down on encrypted channels. And while some lawyers say that new charge of false imprisonment is excessive, other experts say if you look at what protesters are facing in other parts of the country, it's actually lenient. And as crazy as this traffic blockage was, this was not the first time a protest of this magnitude happened. We recently saw one right here on the Bay Bridge just last year. This was the scene on the Bay Bridge in November, protesters calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. This as President Joe Biden and other world leaders were in the Bay Area for the APEC summit. It lasted for several hours. <laughs> And that's the so-called Bay Bridge 78. They were met with cheers as they walked out of a San Francisco courtroom, avoiding jail time. This was back in March and getting a deal to do community service and pay restitution. And the protests included more than just our bridges and our roads. This demonstration in the South Bay got tense for a few moments. This was outside the Tesla factory in Fremont last night. Protesters caravan there, part of a nationwide day of action, demanding a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to all U.S. aid to Israel. I see so many people I know that just keep just going back to their daily life because they don't want to deal with it. We're just going to keep saying, no, we're still here. You know, you, you can't just turn your eye away from this. And we brought you continuing live coverage of the protest shutdowns on air and in streaming on CBS News Bay Area, we'll also have continuing coverage on our website at kpix.com. Well, the Bay Area women's prison rocked by sexual abuse scandals is, is shutting down. It comes after a court-appointed special master arrived at FCI Dublin to oversee reforms. The prison was known among inmates and workers as the Rape Club. That's because of allegations of rampant abuse. And as our Len Ramirez reports, hundreds of inmates could be moved out of the prison in a matter of days. It was not business as usual at the Federal Correctional Institution in Dublin known as FIC. Guards set up a blockade where visitors usually drive into the facility and prison buses could be seen moving into parking lots and driveways, although no inmates appeared to board the buses just yet. We were notified today that the prison is going to be closed by the Bureau of Prisons, and we didn't have any sort of uh, notification prior to this morning. Amaris Montes is an attorney with Rights Behind Bars, an advocacy group that represents inmates and sued the prison over numerous sexual abuse and civil rights violations. She said the shutdown came as a surprise just days after a court-appointed special master came in last week. All 600 inmates could be moved to other facilities by Friday. Their recognition of the fact that they can't meet constitutional requirements now and find that the solution is closure is very telling. And, you know, maybe that is the best step. Last month, the FBI searched the prison as part of a years-long investigation into sexual abuse of inmates by guards. Since 2021, at least eight prison personnel have been charged with abuse. Five pled guilty, two were convicted, and another case is pending. Also pending are 50 civil rights cases. People were subject to, you know, Know, forcible sexual assault by officers who are subject to officers forcing them to conduct strip shows at the facility. Um, and uh, they would do things like that using um, their uh, methods of power. So, you know, saying that they will issue a disciplinary order if they don't do these sexual acts. It's not yet known if the shutdown is temporary or permanent. Inmates and their families are concerned about where they will be sent next to serve out their sentences. And Montes hopes some nonviolent offenders can be credited and have their sentences reduced. We hope that the BOP can take meaningful steps to release people and uh, make sure that, you know, they aren't further harmed throughout this whole process. And the prison employs just over 200 people who could be forced to relocate to keep their jobs. FCI Dublin is one of six women-only federal prisons and the only one west of the Rocky Mountains. Last year, a former warden of the prison was convicted of sexually assaulting multiple women and lying to the FBI. He was sentenced to 70 months in prison. 
Well, San Francisco's sheriff's office puts jails on lockdown after a series of attacks on deputies and other staff members. The union for deputies says the situation is so severe that officials could call in the National Guard. But the sheriff's office calls that idea a little premature, even though some of the injuries from those incidents over the past two weeks are very serious. During the current lockdown, all visits are canceled and various programs and services are on hold. This covers two jails, one in San Francisco, the other in San Bruno. Together, they hold more than 1,100 people. Still ahead on CBS News, Bay Area teachers in South San Francisco are calling it a formula for failure. Why they're sounding an alarm about changes to the middle school math program. Plus, it's one tangible solution to the Bay Area's housing crisis. We meet the volunteers making the dream of home ownership a reality. An allergy season starting earlier than normal, how this year, well, could be worse than last year. Looking back, it's easy to see the unquestionable power of your stories. It gets tougher, you get stronger. When you put that positivity out there, it does multiply. At KPIX, we're on a mission. Good morning. To go beyond news as usual. Because these are the people who connect and inspire us. And these are the stories that define us. Daytime highs today are sitting in the 60s and 70s all throughout the Bay Area. It's a partly cloudy day for us today, but beautiful sunshine is going to kind of be pushing in and out all throughout this afternoon. And to add to that, we're going to continue to warm up as we head into this week's forecast. What I mean by that is we're seeing 70s today from Livermore all the way down into San Jose. But looking at the next seven days, high pressure continues to move its way in and that warms us up and that dries us up. So we'll still see a mix of sun and clouds, but no rain in sight anytime soon. We're seeing 80s by tomorrow, lasting into Thursday. Day. More 80s as we head into our weekend forecast for our inland areas. We've extensively covered the decade long battle to get algebra added back into public middle schools in San Francisco. Now we're hearing from parents and teachers close by in South San Francisco. They're concerned their district is moving in the wrong direction, but people on all sides of this, this debate believe they are doing what's best for kids. Devin Feely reports on why some are saying the district is trying to fix something that's not broken. The advanced math in seventh grade was a stepping stone into Algebra 1. Grace Ree is both a middle school math teacher and the parent of a middle school student. 
and both halves of her identity are wholly in agreement that the changes the South San Francisco School District is thinking about making to its math curriculum are not a formula for success. As an educator and as a mom, I will try my best as a math teacher to help my son supplement with those resources. However, this is not just about my son, it's about all of my students. At Alta Loma, where Grace teaches, the school's top math students often take a special summer course, followed by an accelerated seventh grade math class, combining two years of instruction into one, which in turn sets them up for the rigors of algebra in the eighth grade. Grace says the first sign of trouble was when the district cut the summer class. As an educator, I, as a parent, would like to ask why take away that take away something that has been so beneficial and so crucial. A spokesperson for the school system was insistent that the district is not getting rid of eighth grade algebra, simply changing how students get there, steering most middle schoolers towards an accelerated eighth grade math class. In a prepared statement, the superintendent says the district's goal is to, quote, ensure that students develop a firm and comprehensive grasp of foundational math skills before moving into algebra. But math teachers like Barbara Hahn, who spent decades in the classroom, say the district's tinkering with something that's not broken. Without the kids being in advanced seventh grade um, before they get into algebra, there's, there's no way they're going to get it. The district still has to make a final formal decision about the changes. In the interim, Gray says she will continue to fight for her son and her students against a system she believes will not add up to success. And being able to give all my students a voice when they cannot be heard. Well, the district is still working out some of the details on how they will implement that change next year. People against the decision hope there's still time to convince the district to change course. Educators with San Francisco Unified could get more chances at finding housing in the district. The district will vote today on resolutions declaring two new development sites, prioritizing its employees. One is on 7th Street, just north of Laguna Honda Reservoir. The other is located downtown on Gough Street, just between Page and Haight is on the top of the district's first housing project on 43rd Street. That one is under construction and will include 135 units. The district says the goal is to develop 550 units for teachers by 2030. And the housing crisis in the Bay Area has proven to be a difficult and time-consuming problem to solve. But over the weekend, Habitat for Humanity celebrated the opening of a new development in Walnut Creek. John Ramos has that story. They're still putting the finishing touches on some of these homes, but Habitat for Humanity East Bay chose this day for a welcome home ceremony, the first one since the pandemic. It's an example of how long term the challenge is when it comes to building housing and what can be accomplished with sheer determination. The Spanish word for hope is Esperanza, and it's a fitting name for the newest neighborhood in Walnut Creek. 23 families will soon move into the homes they helped build next to the Pleasant Hill BART station. Janice Jensen, CEO of Habitat for Humanity East Bay Silicon Valley, says these townhomes are an example of how much things have changed over the years. Back in the day, we would build single family homes. Um, we don't do that very much anymore. First of all, the land prices here are so expensive. But Habitat's workforce hasn't changed. About 80% of the project was built with volunteer labor, 40,000 hours for each house. Construction manager Ben Grubb says it's amazing how quickly inexperienced people can learn the trade. Well, you'd be shocked. I mean, the first hour on the, on the, on the job feels like a, like a schoolhouse, right? So you're teaching everyone what to do. But then after that, people come out, they're smart, they're motivated, they want to do a good job, right? So uh, basically, we don't, we're not the fastest builders of all time, but we're very thorough and we do a good job. When they told us that we were selected, I think um, I felt like we had won the lottery. And, and the, having to do a lot of work was, was something that we were looking forward to, um, learning how to build your house, how to you know, how to paint. Yulisa Elenas specialized in painting the interiors of all the homes, even though she had never picked up a brush before. Right now when I go into buildings and to um, other people's homes, I notice the paint and, the, and notice that all of they probably need a retouch. <laughs> <laughs> this new home is a real dream come true for her, since her partner Guillermo is busy full time raising their son Cesar, who faces the challenge of autism. This change for the future 
is so important for us. Here, I see a place for me and Guillermo where we could grow old and take care of Cesar as long as God allows us to. Housing advocates often say the solution to the housing crisis is to simply build more housing, but that doesn't happen quickly. Esperanza Place broke ground in September of 2021, and there are still 19 homes to build. CEO Jensen says just because the solution seems simple, it is by no means easy. Incomes have not risen, costs have skyrocketed. And that creates a, it creates a problem that is very hard to overcome. And we need better public policy, we need more funding, we need everything. The need is everywhere, but so is the willingness to help. All you have to do is ask the people who dream of a place to call their own. And still ahead, spring allergy season seems to be getting worse than last year. A doctor with Stanford will join us to try to explain why. And a reminder, you can stream CBS News Bay Area wherever, whenever. Catch all of our live newscasts plus news and weather updates throughout the day. Find us on the free CBS News app or on Pluto TV. Why are more people turning to KPIX Late Night? Two reasons. Sarah and Stephen. Oh. The Late News with Sarah Donchi. Then The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Back with all new episodes. Really? Two shows you'll want to spend the night with. Then go to sleep knowing you won at TV. What? Record it. Stream it. Watch it live. The Late News oh. and the all new Late Show. Weeknights starting at 11 on KPIX. It's a beautiful day for us here in the Bay Area with 60s and 70s felt widespread throughout the Bay. Now this puts us above average and we're continuing to warm up as we head into the next seven days. Taking a look at our daytime highs today, it doesn't matter whether you live near Napa with the light winds into this afternoon or off into the East Bay, we're seeing that warmth really highlight the Bay. As we head into the next couple days, those 70s are actually going to get replaced with 80s right around the corner. So better yet, let's take a look at the next seven days on our models. Now, tomorrow and lasting into our Thursday forecast, we're seeing low 80s all throughout our inland areas, kind of flirting back and forth with the 70s and 80s heading into our weekend forecast. If you live along the bay, so closer to San Francisco or Oakland, we'll see a little bit cooler weather close to that bay shoreline. 70s kind of flirting with 60s heading into our weekend forecast with partly cloudy skies lasting into early next week. Well, with all the weather changes happening lately here in the Bay Area, you may have noticed that your 
Allergies have been acting up a little bit earlier than expected. And as warmer temperatures start to become more apparent and precipitation levels increase, plants begin to produce more pollen as they continue to grow in size. Researchers have found that pollen concentrations have risen about 20% nationwide since 1990. And joining me now is Dr. Jyothi Teramalasade with the Allergy and Immunology at Stanford Healthcare. Uh, it always seems like allergy season is starting earlier and earlier. Uh, what are you seeing this year? We are seeing it start early this year as well, Ryan, and we've already seen a high concentration of tree pollen, and that's been going on since the end of March. So if you're noticing a lot of allergy symptoms, there's a reason for that. And, and what exactly are allergies and what is an allergic reaction? Allergies happen when someone who's sensitized to an airborne particle, such as pollen, uh, gets uh, exposed to that airborne particle and breathes it in. And if you're sensitized, your allergic antibodies create an allergic reaction that's mediated through your allergic cells. Those allergic cells produce a lot of mediators like histamine that can then cause the symptoms of allergy, things like itchy eyes, sneezing, congestion, runny nose. Yeah, my sinuses are kind of blocked up right now. So how can you tell if you have allergies versus maybe a cold, flu, or, or even COVID? That's a great question. And I would say that the onset of a cold is gonna be a little bit faster. And you're gonna notice that there might be other people around you who are sick as well. But with a cold, you might see symptoms like a fever, and body aches and kind of a sudden onset of a sore throat. With allergies, I'd say your symptoms are gonna last a lot longer. Typically we don't see fevers, we shouldn't see uh, things like a body ache. It's gonna be more a lot of itching, runny nose, sneezing, things like that. And so what's the best way to kind of combat the allergy symptoms, especially a lot of sneezing, especially those itchy eyes? I think on high pollen days, uh, if you can check the pollen counts and try to avoid maybe doing your workout outdoors on that day, uh, maybe use the treadmill indoors that day. And if you are going to work out outside, maybe uh, cover your mouth and your nose, a mask could also help. And when you do come back home after your um, outdoor time, consider changing your clothes, taking a shower, kind of rinsing that pollen uh, off of you. I think all those things can help. And of course, we've got lots of medications available. Antihistamines over the counter as well can help. Uh, maybe taking those ahead of time before you head out. Yeah, how much do the over-the-counter me medications help? I would say that they help with at least some of the symptoms. It really depends on you know how significant your allergies are. I'd say a good amount of folks can get away with taking an over-the-counter pill and, and going about their day and functioning and others may need a more detailed evaluation, allergy testing, and possibly additional treatments, um, maybe through an allergist or their primary care doctor. And, and as we had mentioned, it seems like it's becoming earlier and earlier. Do we know of this trend of an earlier allergy season? Will that continue next year and in years to come? It really seems like it. A lot of the studies that we're seeing, we're, we're seeing across the country, not just in our area, that spring is starting earlier and earlier. And I think our weather, weather patterns, like you mentioned, have really contributed to that. And so it seems like we're almost getting to a point where it's year round in certain areas. Oh, okay, well, everyone hang in there. <laughs> Stay indoors, don't work out outside. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for joining us. Always good information. Thank you, Ryan. And coming up in our next half hour in CBS News Bay Area, a brave young woman coping with a rare childhood disease that impacts the brain how her family is fighting for a lifeline to get the medicine that they need. Never in a million years did I think 13 years later that I would still be fighting for the same medication. And how these puppies are benefiting from San Quentin inmates hey and the community. Hey these are your neighborhoods. This is your world. CBS News Bay Area. And still ahead on KPI. With Juliet Goodrich. And the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Taking you to the day's top stories. Smart, comprehensive coverage. And immersive weather like you have never seen it. Join Juliet Goodrich and Nora O'Donnell. Weeknights, 6 to 7.30 
on KPIX. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is the Minute. SFMTA will vote today on proposed speed camera locations throughout the city. If approved, the city could get a new technology by 2025. These cameras are located near schools, senior centers, and along the city's so-called high-injury network. Alameda County DA Pamela Price will face a recall. The Registrar of Voters says enough valid signatures were gathered, and the Board of Supervisors will now discuss the results at a meeting on April 30th, then schedule a special election. No comment yet from the DA or her team. Three people under arrest and dozens cited after a wild night of sideshows in Oakland over the weekend. Police tell us officers cited 52 people towed 21 cars early Sunday. Investigators say drivers and spectators took over at least six major intersections from west to east Oakland. I'm Brian Yamamoto. This is The Minute. It's another dry day for us today here in the Bay Area with warmer temperatures right around the corner. Now, high pressure sitting just offshore, and that's the reason why we're warming up and drying up as we head into this work week. And taking a look at the winds, it's also the reason why we're seeing those winds mostly sweep in from offshore and just from the north, too, heading into this afternoon with wind speeds maxing off close to around 15 miles per hour, closer to around dinner time. Other than that, though, it's a dry week for us, not only today and tomorrow, but lasting into our weekend setup, too. No rain in sight as high pressure sits directly offshore. It's going to keep us nice and dry and warm too. Our daytime highs today are sitting just a little bit above average and will continue to warm up as we head into the next couple of days. About four to five degrees above average near San Francisco and Oakland, a similar trend down into the Santa Clara Valley. So let's take a look at those numbers over on the map now. 60s in San Francisco, not that bad. We'll see 70s by tomorrow. We're already seeing 70s off in the East Bay. That'll get replaced with 80s heading into our weekend forecast. And it's going to be a stunning one for us down in the Santa Clara Valley. As early as tomorrow, we'll be close to around 81 degrees degrees just near San Jose. So that's the trend for us. We're flirting back and forth with upper 70s and lower 80s all week long heading into our inland forecast and mostly sunny skies are expected for us, but we'll still see a little bit of clouds kind of mixed in the forecast. Nothing producing rain by any means. It's going to be dry for us along the bay too with upper 60s and lower 70s heading into our weekend forecast. We'll keep you updated on that here in the Weather Center. Well, families of children with a rare disease that impacts their brains are hoping new legislation in Sacramento will help them get the medicine that they need. The bill will require health insurance companies to cover the disease and treatments, and as 
Len Ramirez reports it's been a long struggle for one South Bay family. This is the magic IVIG. Um, this is what we've been waiting for. They finally flew it in last night. For 26-year-old Tessa Gallo, waiting four months for a shipment of medication is just part of her medical ordeal. There's the painful IV hookup. How long did it take you this time? Um, a long time. <laughs> it took like, I think close to three hours to find her vein and the 12 hours it takes to get the medication infused. And on this day, it all became too uh, much. This is the hardest disease I've ever been through. <laughs> it's not easy for me. <laughs> it's not that you've been brave. Tessa suffers from an autoimmune disorder called PANS, or Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. It struck her one day when she was a happy, healthy 13-year-old. Overnight, um, on July 8, 2011, Tessa dramatically changed. The disease is marked by a sudden devastating onset when a patient's antibodies attack the parts of their brain that regulate behavior, causing OCD, tics, and other symptoms. Became psychotic and developmentally delayed, and um, I knew something was wrong. Unfortunately, it took about 10 months to figure out her diagnosis, that it was actually not bipolar or schizophrenia. It was actually something called PANS. Tessa's mother and advocate Terry Downing says she was in and out of psych wards and given many drugs for what doctors thought was a mental illness. That is until a new team of doctors at Lucille Packard suspected PANS. They started a clinic after her and started uh, giving her something called IVIG and rituximab. Um, both very expensive drugs. The drugs ease Tessa's symptoms and make dramatic positive changes in many other patients with PANS and a related condition called PANDAS, which starts as a strep infection. Tessa takes the medicine once every three months, but Downing says it's been a struggle since day one to get the drugs covered by insurance companies. Never in a million years did I think 13 years later that I would still be fighting for the same medication. The treatment is not inexpensive. I'm the first to say that. Dr. Mark Pasternak is an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard University and one of the nation's leading researchers into PANS and PANDAS. He says there's a lot the wider medical community still doesn't know about the disease and patients are often denied coverage with drug costs being a major factor. For teenagers, it's probably close to $15,000 of treatment. But given that they often prevent psychiatric hospitalizations, they're cost effective. 11 states have passed legislation requiring insurance companies to cover PANS and PANDAS. California could be next. California has a, a core group of parents working hard now to get AB 2105. Dr. Angela Tang is also the mother of a PANDAS patient who says the California like bill would require insurance companies to cover doctor prescribed treatments, which could include IVIG and other drugs. If Governor Newsom will sign this law, we will be able to be a role model and a very large domino in, um, in getting the rest of the states, you know, the 38 other states without protections to get them to follow suit. If passed, the legislation would help patients like Tessa get the medicine when they need it. When I'm waiting for the medicine, I feel like upset, kind of sad that it didn't come and stuff like that. Although she suffered some brain damage because of her earlier misdiagnosis and treatment delays, Tessa's enrolled in the College of Adaptive Arts and works part-time in a bakery. Doctors say her therapies are working and for now, the disease is in remission. And up next, it's winner go home for the Warriors tonight in Sacramento. Why Steve Kerr feels good about their chances.
Daytime highs today are sitting in the 60s and 70s all throughout the Bay Area. It's a partly cloudy day for us today, but beautiful sunshine is going to kind of be pushing in and out all throughout this afternoon. And to add to that, we're going to continue to warm up as we head into this week's forecast. What I mean by that is we're seeing 70s today from Livermore all the way down into San Jose. But looking at the next seven days, high pressure continues to move its way in and that warms us up and that dries us up. So we'll still see a mix of sun and clouds, but no rain in sight anytime soon. We're seeing 80s by tomorrow, lasting into Thursday. Thursday, more 80s as we head into our weekend forecast for our inland areas. Well, it's been a breakthrough moment for women's sports and women's college basketball specifically. Millions tuned into the women's NCAA tournament. Many of those players were in last night's WNBA draft, including Cameron Brink from Stanford that was selected with a second overall pick in the draft. The three-time All-American will stay in California, play for the Los Angeles Sparks, this was the highest a Cardinal player has been drafted ever since Janae Ogumake went number one back in 2014. The six foot four Brink was a two time National Defensive Player of the Year. And the Warriors are on the road tonight, but Thrive City will be rocking. There will be a play in watch party starting at 5 30. Fans will get to enjoy live music before the game is streamed on the video board. And tip off is at seven tonight against the Kings in Sacramento. It's a win or go home for these Northern California rivals. The winner will travel to the loser of the Lakers and Pelicans game to see who makes it into the playoffs as the eighth seed in the Western Conference. And today is just another date up the road in Sacramento for the second straight season for the Dubs. You'll remember the Warriors beat the Kings in the first round of the playoffs last year. Vern Glenn as the Dubs' path to the postseason. I believe in karma. I, I think this, this group has earned some, some, good, some good karma. sure there's plenty of teams over the course of the NBA history that felt like karma was coming to them and it didn't. The Warriors believe they will have more than karma on their side. They also have Steph Curry. He's that guy, you know. Um, he's him, I think Austin Reeves said. <laughs> the last time Steph played an elimination game in Sacramento, scored 50 points and led the Dubs to a Game 7 win. Kind of ironic, just everything that was built up to that Game 7. This is technically a Game 7 type environment in the same building, so we got to do it again. But he shouldn't have to perform a solo. Instead, it'll be a familiar trio leading the way. This team is about Steph, Clay, and Draymond. Steve Kerr credited Clay Thompson and Draymond Green for the team's turnaround after the All-Star break. First half of the season, neither one was right. Um, emotionally, spiritually, however you want to put it. And once they turned the corner, it affected the whole team because that's how it works. No, we're capable of going to win some road games. Uh, and when this team's back is against the wall, I like how the group shows up. And coming up, how these dogs are giving criminals new purpose by allowing them to do good from behind the walls prison. It's taught me a lot of compassion, uh, a lot of awareness. We literally don't want anything in return but to just have the joy of this dog.
Oh, it's a beautiful day for us here in the Bay Area with 60s and 70s felt widespread throughout the Bay. Now this puts us above average and we're continuing to warm up as we head into the next seven days. Taking a look at our daytime highs today, it doesn't matter whether you live near Napa with the light winds into this afternoon or off into the East Bay. We're seeing that warmth really highlight the Bay. As we head into the next couple days, those 70s are actually going to get replaced with 80s right around the corner. So better yet, let's take a look at the next seven days on our models. Now, tomorrow and lasting into our Thursday forecast, we're seeing low 80s all throughout our inland areas, kind of flirting back and forth with the 70s and 80s heading into our weekend forecast. If you live along the bay, so closer to San Francisco or Oakland, we'll see a little bit cooler weather close to that bay shoreline. 70s kind of flirting with 60s heading into our weekend forecast with partly cloudy skies lasting into early next week. Well, it may be undergoing a transformation, but San Quentin is still home to some of the toughest criminals in California. But behind the walls are opportunities for redemption and purpose, all thanks to puppies. Our Max Darrow has been following an impactful program that allows inmates to train service dogs. He takes us inside the prison for puppy school graduation. Day-to-day -day life for the residents of San Quentin can be fairly simple. This cell is Chase Benoit's bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, and living room. It's where he makes his life, for now at least, because nearly 10 years ago, he took a life. I committed a murder, that's why I'm in prison. But instead of letting life pass him by, he spent the last year helping bring new life to strangers on the outside. We met Benoit and Wendell a year ago when he became one of the first puppy raisers at the San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. He's a part of a program where select incarcerated individuals raise and train puppies to become service animals that nonprofit group Canine Companions will pair with people with disabilities for free. San Quentin officials see it as a valuable rehabilitation tool for some inmates that also benefits the community. Benoit sees it as a way to give back to a community that he took from. There's no good that I can do that would make up for the harm that I've done. I might not be able to take it back, but. I could dedicate my life to just continuously changing uh, and trying to be a better person. And on this day, Benoit and several others stood before a crowd to be recognized for the good they've done and to see their puppies off. The first of what will be many graduating classes of the San Quentin Puppy Raising Program. Our mission is to change lives through the power of human canine bonds. We are very much looking at expanding this program, not only here, but throughout the state and, quite frankly, throughout the nation. One touch. On stage, Benoit demonstrated some of the commands and skills he and his peers have taught Wendell over the last year. And in the crowd, watching intently, was Marv Tuttle, a Vietnam veteran who knows how a service animal can change a life, whose first service dog was prison raised, who happens to be Benoit's grandfather. This is the, the difference in someone's life that you can make. On stage alongside his grandson, Tuttle said his service dog helps with day-to-day -day tasks, but most importantly, his dog helps him feel connection with other people. The prison program brings a lot to the table, not just in what it does for the inmates, but what it does for us as recipients of these service dogs. And from what he's noticed over the last year, the program is helping his grandson grow. It definitely has made a big difference for him. He, he sees what he's capable of doing. Yeah. A year ago, we also met another incarcerated puppy raiser, Aaron Ramsey. It's taught me a lot of compassion. Uh, a lot of awareness. He says the ability to experience joy has inspired him to want to do more good. This program has gave me a lot, a lot of responsibility, has taught me a lot about accountability, uh, working with others. We're really breaking ground here at San Quentin Rehabilitation Center, and I'm just glad to be a part of the change. San Quentin used to be called the death house, right? It just gives you some insight into what can happen if enough people put their heads together to try to do something for the better. After numerous handshakes and a moment of gratitude, this unusual but powerful day at San Quentin came to a close. But a new chapter is beginning for Benoit. Hey, girl. He's starting from scratch once again with a new puppy named Margaret. And so it's a great responsibility to know that, like, what I teach her now, she's going to hold for the rest of her life. Benoit says he knows that this opportunity is a privilege. Hey, little lady. He can't change the past, but by doing this, he can make the future better for others. 
for people like his grandfather. And he hopes more people outside the prison walls can see and appreciate that. Like, use us. Like, we literally don't want anything in return but to just have the joy of this dog. And in return, we'll give you so much more. Uh, we'll give it our, our heart. And uh, we're going to try to change as many lives as possible. Puppies providing a powerful purpose in a place once only known for punishment. And Canine Companion says the puppies raised by the prisoners have a 10% higher success rate of actually becoming accredited service dogs. When they become service dogs, Canine Companion places them with people in need, free of charge, who will follow up for life. Meanwhile, San Quentin is undergoing a transformation on its own. It's been renamed the San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. The new name is all part of Governor Gavin Newsom's effort to empty death row and focus on rehab, education, and job training. Okay, now for a look at some of today's most talked about stories. The Portola Music Festival returns to San Francisco for a third year, and it's promising neighbors to be better about the noise after complaints. The Electronic Music Festival will be at Pier 80 this year on September 28th to 29th. The promoter, Golden Voice, sent out a letter saying they're going to focus on better noise control measures this year. This comes after last year's event drew complaints from people living in both San Francisco and the East Bay. Popular video app TikTok, TikTok making headlines again as another bill to ban the platform is on the line for a House vote this week. This time it's included in a package of four foreign aid bills. About 170 million Americans use the platform. Banning it faces a lot of opposition. And 49er Faithful have a new way to represent their team. They've launched new Niner-themed California license plates featuring the team's logo, colors, and slogan. Faithful to State Parks, which is the reference to the state parks and new sports programs that some of the money will be allocated to. Plates are now available for pre-order on their website. Well, thanks for streaming CBS News Bay Area. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. We'll be right back with your first alert forecast and a look at your top stories.
I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is The Minute. Scott Peterson is back in court today. The convicted killer is appearing by Zoom in San Mateo County Court. The L.A. Innocence Project recently took up his case more than 20 years after Peterson was convicted of murdering his wife Lacey and their unborn son. The project believes some key evidence was ignored. Arrests have been made after two women were shot and killed in Napa on Saturday. Police arrested 22-year-old John Nicholson Jr. in Vallejo last night. He's charged with two counts of homicide. Two others were arrested this morning in Santa Rosa for aiding in a felony. 38 people are under arrest after hundreds of protesters shut down 880 in Oakland and the Golden Gate Bridge. The demonstrators were drawing attention to the war in Gaza. It started early yesterday morning and lasted until the afternoon. Those arrested will face multiple charges, including unlawful assembly. I'm Ryan Yamamoto. This is The Minute. It's another dry day for us today here in the Bay Area with warmer temperatures right around the corner. Now, high pressure sitting just offshore, and that's the reason why we're warming up and drying up as we head into this work week. And taking a look at the winds, it's also the reason why we're seeing those winds mostly sweep in from offshore and just from the north, too, heading into this afternoon with wind speeds maxing off close to around 15 miles per hour, closer to around dinner time. Other than that, though, it's a dry week for us, not only today and tomorrow, but lasting into our weekend setup, too. No rain in sight as high pressure sits directly offshore. It's going to keep us nice and dry and warm too. Our daytime highs today are sitting just a little bit above average and will continue to warm up as we head into the next couple days. About four to five degrees above average near San Francisco and Oakland. A similar trend down into the Santa Clara Valley. So let's take a look at those numbers over on the map now. 60s in San Francisco, not that bad. We'll see 70s by tomorrow. We're already seeing 70s off into the East Bay. That'll get replaced with 80s heading into our weekend forecast. And it's going to be a stunning one for us down in the Santa Clara Valley. As early as tomorrow, we'll be close to around 81 degrees degrees just near San Jose. So that's the trend for us. We're flirting back and forth with upper 70s and lower 80s all week long heading into our inland forecast and mostly sunny skies are expected for us, but we'll still see a little bit of clouds kind of mixed in the forecast. Nothing producing rain by any means. It's going to be dry for us along the bay too with upper 60s and lower 70s heading into our weekend forecast. We'll keep you updated on that here in the Weather Center. Well, yesterday you might have been caught up in this. Hundreds of protesters shut down these Major Bay Area arteries, 880 in Oakland and the Golden Gate Bridge, all to draw attention to the war in Gaza. Some even used chains and barrels filled with concrete to block the road. We asked one of the protesters on 880 about their message yesterday. They want to say that they're condemning what's happening, what Israel is doing, saying they want Israel to be nicer and kill fewer civilians. At the same time, they are giving them bombs and money. Well, the shutdowns lasted into the early afternoon before CHP was able to get all the lanes reopened. We know some commuters were stuck in their car for cars for more than four hours. At the beginning with, I was kind of afraid. I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I was afraid for my life. This is not fair for, you know, a lot of people, they go into work. You know, they're trying to, you know, make some money and uh, look what happened. And while the CHP had their attention on 880, another group took over the Golden Gate Bridge. Highway Patrol said they thought something like this might happen, but did not know specific plans. Protest organizers were very clear that this action was not their last, and a spokesperson told us what's expected to come next. We're going to keep pushing until people pay attention. We know from our history that people's actions work, and they won't listen to us unless we hit them where it hurts, which is in, a, in the economic region. And as the hours dragged on, commuters stuck on the roads had no choice but to wait it out. Although some were sympathetic to the protesters, some were also very frustrated. Like, yes, it's an inconvenience, but it's also an inconvenient to be a human being in Gaza. And when you have this level of a disruption to our whole transportation system, I think we need to draw a line. CHP says they arrested 26 protesters at the bridge demonstration. Four cars were impounded. A total of 38 people were arrested across both protests at the Golden Gate Bridge and 880. And our Sean Chittenis reports from the Golden Gate Bridge with a breakdown of the charges that they will face. It's turning out to be another typical morning along the Golden Gate Bridge with traffic moving in both directions. Quite the difference from what we saw yesterday. Today we know more about what charges protesters will be facing because of their actions on the bridge. Those charges include unlawful assembly, resisting an officer conspiracy, as well as false imprisonment. And that last one is a new charge we haven't seen before. 
because of what they were able to do, keeping people stuck in their cars for hours. It speaks to the amount of preparedness that these protesters had for their actions, making sure it was as difficult as possible to remove them with heavy chains and barrels filled with cement. The CHP was quick to get in position on the Bay Bridge during all of this, but experts say they can only be so proactive with their current staffing. Every single law enforcement agency in California is shorthanded. And the more that we put these folks in a, in a position where they're sitting idly on a bridge, the more they can be doing things more productive elsewhere. So that's sort of a double-edged sword and a, and, a, and a personnel manpower challenge that they have to deal with. That's former FBI Special Agent Jeff Harp. He was actually one of the commuters caught up in the traffic yesterday. He says another thing that makes these kinds of protests tough to get ahead of, we're no longer seeing planning happening on social media. It's all going down on encrypted channels. And while some lawyers say that new charge of false imprisonment is excessive, other experts say if you look at what protesters are facing in other parts of the the country, it's actually lenient. And as crazy as this traffic blockage was, this was not the first time a protest of this magnitude happened. We recently saw one right here on the Bay Bridge just last year. This was the scene on the Bay Bridge in November, protesters calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. This as President Joe Biden and other world leaders were in the Bay Area for the APEC summit. It lasted for several hours. <laughs> And that's the so-called Bay Bridge 78. They were met with cheers as they walked out of a San Francisco courtroom, avoiding jail time. This was back in March and getting a deal to do community service and pay restitution. And the protests included more than just our bridges and our roads. This demonstration in the South Bay got tense for a few moments. This was outside the Tesla factory in Fremont last night. Protesters caravan there, part of a nationwide day of action demanding a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to all U.S. aid to Israel. I see so many people I know that just keep just going back to their daily life because they don't want to deal with it. We're just going to keep saying, no, we're still here. You know, you, you can't just turn your eye away from this. And we brought you continuing live coverage of the protest shutdowns on air and streaming on CBS News Bay Area. We'll also have continuing coverage on our website at kpix.com. Bay Area women's prison rocked by sexual abuse scandals is, is shutting down. It comes after a court-appointed special master arrived at FCI Dublin to oversee reforms. The prison was known among inmates and workers as the Rape Club. That's because of allegations of rampant abuse, and as our Len Ramirez reports, hundreds of inmates could be moved out of the prison in a matter of days. It was not business as usual at the Federal Correctional Institution in Dublin known as FIC. Guards set up a blockade where visitors usually drive into the facility and prison buses could be seen moving into parking lots and driveways, although no inmates appeared to board the buses just yet. We were notified today that the prison is going to be closed by the Bureau of Prisons, and we didn't have any sort of uh, notification prior to this morning. Amaris Montes is an attorney with Rights Behind Bars, an advocacy group that represents inmates and sued the prison over numerous sexual abuse and civil rights violations. She said the shutdown came as a surprise just days after a court-appointed special master came in last week. All 600 inmates could be moved to other facilities by Friday. Their recognition of the fact that they can't meet constitutional requirements now and find that the solution is closure is very telling and you know maybe that is the best step last month the fbi searched the prison as part of a years-long investigation into sexual abuse of inmates by guards since 2021 at least eight prison personnel have been charged with abuse five pled guilty two were convicted and another case is pending also pending are 50 civil rights cases people were subject to you know forcible sexual assault by officers who are subject to officers forcing them to conduct strip shows at the facility um, and uh, they would do things like that using um, their 
uh, methods of power. So, you know, saying that they will issue a disciplinary order if they don't do these sexual acts. It's not yet known if the shutdown is temporary or permanent. Inmates and their families are concerned about where they will be sent next to serve out their sentences. And Montez hopes some nonviolent offenders can be credited and have their sentences reduced. We hope that the BOP can take meaningful steps to release people and uh, make sure that, you know, they aren't further harmed throughout this whole process. And the prison employs just over 200 people who could be forced to relocate to keep their jobs. FCI Dublin is one of six women-only federal prisons and the only one west of the Rocky Mountains. Last year, a former warden of the prison was convicted of sexually assaulting multiple women and lying to the FBI. He was sentenced to 70 months in prison. Well, San Francisco's sheriff's office puts jails on lockdown after a series of attacks on deputies and other staff members. The union for deputies says the situation